Yeah, so Siobhan Colleen is on the line via Zoom. How are you, Siobhan? I'm good. Um, feeling much better than the last time we spoke. Yeah. And kind of life has returned to some somewhat normality, back in work, back out of that room that I was stuck in for two weeks. So, yeah, I, I can't really complain now. Yeah, talk to me about that, Siobhan, and the isolation piece, because obviously when you um, were diagnosed with COVID, you had to go into self-isolation. How did you manage that? I suppose I was lucky enough, I live with my parents, so I was able to isolate in my room and still have like my meals brought up to me and everything. So it was kind of easy enough for me. And I suppose the first week, my energy levels were really low and I wasn't feeling the best. So I slept the whole way through the first week. Okay. So that passed really quickly. And the second week, kind of just like when I started to feel better, cleaned around my room. You know, I had neighbors outside that I could chat through the window and a few of my friends late evenings walking their dogs used to stop by and we'd be shouting across from my window to the to the path. So, uh, yeah, it, it went by pretty quickly, pretty quickly and uh, quite easily, thankfully. Um, this might seem like a strange question, but is there some kind of routine that you can find, even though you're confined to such a such a space? Can you get some kind of routine in your day? Yeah, well, I had a few colleagues um, from the hospital that had been diagnosed positive as well. So they were kind of my support system and um, they were helping me along the way, telling me, you know, get up out of bed in the morning, make your bed, try not get back into it. Because otherwise it, you'd really struggle if you were sitting in bed all day. So okay. you do, you get into a routine. I used to try to make to-do lists and um, I love ticking, ticking things off a list. So I used to make them and, and just work my way through it. Um, yeah, you kind of have to kind of get up and, and do something and when you feel good enough to try and make the time go quicker. Siobhan, having suffered the, the hamstring injury last year that we, we, we spoke about in our original conversation and having worked your way back to a position where you were actually back uh, playing, what could, you, what could you do during that time to stay, you know, to maintain your base levels of fitness at the, at the very least? There's not much and still I'm struggling quite a lot without any gym access. Um, you know, you can do a little bit with a few dumbbells and kettlebells, but to be really strengthening my hamstring, I need a lot of heavy weights. Um, and firstly, you couldn't get them anywhere. Gym equipment seemed to just sell out immediately when the place went into lockdown. And secondly, they're really expensive. So, um, and I, my parents would not let me have a few hundred kg of dumbbells hitting the floor of my room. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's tough to keep the strength up. Um, through the physio with the team and the strength and conditioning coach, I've some running to be doing and a bit of rehab that I can do, you know, with, with the equipment I have. So, you know, I kind of believe everything happens for a reason. Um, and I think maybe my hamstring needed it. I was getting back. I was getting a bit of game time under my belt, but it was starting to hurt a little. You know, I have a lot of sitting pain sometimes because where the operation was on my sitting bone. And um, that was actually getting quite bad just before this all happened so I haven't felt it since so maybe the hamstring is you know with the the lesser load it's it's healing and it's it's getting better okay can, can I take you back to that when it first happened that injury Siobhan because it was quite innocuous it was on it, as injuries go it was on the training ground um yeah. but it turned out to be quite a devastating injury it was if I was probably better at defending it might not happen it was in one of ones and I was with Collins and it was her time to attack and sure she turned me inside out and just turned into a collision and it went and people actually said on the team they thought I just rolled my ankle okay. but um, I, I knew it was bad you know I had a panic attack on the pitch and it took a long time for it was Claire and Roth that had to lift me from where I was after I could get my breath back you know after I could start breathing normally and they lift me behind the pitch and the pain kind of eased quite quickly but it was this shooting kind of nerve pain that I would get and no no position eased the pain, you know, like it wasn't like if I wasn't moving, it wasn't sore. It was just a kind of continuous pain. Um so yeah, it was it didn't look too bad, but my physio immediately said, We we like we know you've torn your hamstring, we need to find out if it's on or off the bone. But sure, that to me was a different language. I'd never heard of tearing your hamstring off the bone. I knew Paul O'Connell Paul O'Connell had done a really bad injury to his hamstring, yeah. but I didn't know the ins of it and outs of it. Um but once I got the results, sure, everyone told me, Asher, oh, sure, that's the same as Paul O'Connell. That's what ended him. So, yeah, it, um, it didn't seem like a lot. You know, it wasn't a bad tackle or collision. It was just one of those things. And it was something I felt guilty about. You know, when I met my surgeon in Santry, I had said to him, like, was I at fault? You know, was I not conditioned well enough? Was my hamstring too weak? Was I 
overtired and he said no it's just one movement it just took one movement to to cause it to come off the balance so that that was probably what I definitely needed to hear and um, okay. you know th- that there wasn't anything I could have done to prevent it it was just one of those things that happened and I had no control over it. Yeah and the timing of it as well Siobhan because you'd come off the back of a brilliant um, club campaign um, with Clontarf scoring that memorable 5-4 in the All-Ireland Intermediate Final um, and you were, you know, from the outside looking in and watching your progress, you were just starting to hit your stride with the Dublin team as well, and then your effectively your your entire season was written off. Yeah, it, that was something I did struggle with, you know, because I felt in 2019 I was really going to push on from everything I'd learned and developed in 2018 with the team, but I still got to stay involved, and you know, even though I've played Gaelic since I was young, that break in the middle when I was just playing soccer, you know, my knowledge of Gaelic really decreased again. So I used this year to spend a lot of the time looking from the stand where you see a lot of things. You know, I got to watch the likes of Nerdy, Macker, Nicole, all the girls training and playing. When when you're on the pitch, you don't notice that. Or, you know, if you're on the training ground with them, you don't see what they do. So it was great to still learn. You know, I spent the eight months that I was on the sidelines learning from the girls although I couldn't put it into practice I was learning you know a lot of the game is played in your head so I got to increase my knowledge of the game increase my like knowledge of what the best players do and then this year I just wanted to put that into practice hopefully. Okay um, things are on, on hold at the moment obviously but you've come through a, a long um, rehabilitation um, process Siobhan to get back to to where you are now um, and then Obviously, uh, the, the current pandemic strikes and you're right at the front line of it as well. Um, talk me through a little bit about what you do uh, f- for work and then how you first uh, started to experience the symptoms, which eventually led to the, the positive diagnosis. Yeah, so I'm a radiographer in the Matter Hospital. Um, a lot of people don't know what radiographers are or do. You know, um, we get mistaken for nurses quite a lot. So we're just in diagnostic imaging. Um, okay. you know when you come into hospital if you're getting x-ray ct scans mris ultrasounds there's some interventional radiology as well which people will be having done and then nuclear medicine so there is a broad range of you know what we can do Um i just work in mri the cat lab nuclear medicine and then just general x-ray so in terms of covid you know a lot of these patients would be coming in with respiratory symptoms so they'd be having x-rays or else CT scans. So often we'd be one of the first few people to meet patients um, and we'd meet them before they're positive. You know, we'd deal mainly with query COVIDs before they're finding out if they're positive or negative. Um, so we have to obviously treat them all the same. And then during their process of recovery, you know, if they deteriorate, they'll need more diagnostic scans, more use of the radiology services, and then those that are getting better we see less of and there's some that don't like I never had x-rays done of my chest or a CT scan I was lucky enough not to be too sick to have to go to hospital but there is a lot in hospital that need the scans and need the tests done. Okay because I, well, I dropped you a text then because I wanted to find out how you were doing from the injury and then you dropped a little bombshell that you'd, uh, you'd start to experience some symptoms in that and yours you know, you, you trained pretty much all that weekend. You were out very active. And then I think on the Sunday evening, you, you just started to yeah. not feel very well. Yeah, it hit me very quickly. Um, I was working all weekend, training all weekend. And I came in Sunday evening and I was sitting on the couch watching the television with my parents. And I just I just became really hot. Um, I was sweating and I was actually as usual that I would do, be giving out about the temperature in the house, giving out to my lamp for having heating on. So I sat there for about half an hour still sweating and then I had a headache and then it kind of hit me, you know, there's potential that I'm sick and this isn't just the heat in the house that's causing me to sweat. So I went up to the room and all night I was really sick. My body started to really hurt then. Um, I had really bad back pain all through the night. That kind of kept me up. And then the next morning, I'd hardly slept and the next morning I rang into work sick and it was sorted from there that I'd have to get a test just because I worked in the hospital. If I was positive, then the contact tracing wouldn't just be, you know, who I see in my private life and outside the hospital, but they'd also have to trace potential patients. And so they have to act quite quickly then to find out if, if you have it or not. So from there, I went into the hospital on Monday, had the test done and got the result on Tuesday. And I was, 
I was quite sick, you know, until kind of Wednesday. So I hadn't made contact with, really with many people to tell them because I just wasn't on my phone. I wasn't up to it. And then on, I started telling my family, just a few of my close friends and my colleagues from work, obviously now. But I just said to people, you know, like, yeah, I'm positive and I'm not really going to like tell loads of people. So everyone kind of just kept it to themselves. And then sure, when I had met you, we were talking about the injury and um, I just said it to you. Then all my friends gave me awful sticks saying, I thought you were just keeping it quiet. And I told people you were feeling fine and you didn't have any this and that. <laughs> so um, I got a bit of a stick over that from my friends. But yeah, it's, you know, it's nothing I was ashamed of. Um, there was a guilty feeling I had when I first got diagnosed. I can't really explain it. I know a few of my colleagues felt the same. You know, I was never too worried about myself. It's just this really weird, guilty feeling that, like, I'm now a risk to people, or I have been a risk to people. And immediately I thought of my parents. Thankfully, they'd never been symptomatic. They didn't catch it, so I'm that's probably what I'm happiest about, you know, that they were safe during it all. And, and I'm over it now. I'm, I'm back to, to normal life. So I'm just thankful it went so smoothly for me. Yeah, the guilt thing, I find it strange because we, the people at the front line, we consider you guys heroes, you know. So uh, I hope that guilt feeling has, has passed and eased a little for you now. Yeah, no, it definitely has. It's just that, you know, I wasn't overly sick at this time. You know, I just typical kind of fluey symptoms, the fever, the sweats, the aches. My lungs seemed okay, but, you know, immediately you, you see the numbers on the telly of people passing away. I had seen people that were, you know, admitted to, well, I'm carrying this fire, like this virus. I'm a risk to people. Um, I'm a risk to really vulnerable people. That's just the kind of feeling you get. I was never worried about myself. I was always worried that, you know, God, what if I gave it to people and that? But luckily, I wasn't really in contact with anyone for long enough. My parents were the biggest risk and they were fine so I was just thankful it went as it did. Okay you didn't have many of the respiratory symptoms that are, that are associated with this um, this virus but you did have other symptoms which you, you said to me aren't talked about quite as much. Your, some of your senses for example have, have you reclaimed those? Yeah that was one when I started noticing I, I hadn't heard anything about it but when I spoke to a few of my colleagues they said they experienced the same and it's been mentioned quite a lot now it's been in the media as well about it but the loss of smell and taste the loss of taste yeah completely and um, so I started like eating things I didn't really like like for, I used to have kiwis at lunch because I hate kiwis but I was making the most of being able to taste them because I couldn't taste a thing um, which and the doctor with the Dublin team sent me on this drink and the look of it would turn your tummy but I couldn't taste it at all so you know I just made the most of, made the most of it but then I was getting lovely baked goods dropped around and cakes and everything and I you couldn't make like you couldn't enjoy them for what they were I'd love them now but uh I still had to eat them I couldn't <laughs> let them go to wait uh, but yeah, yeah go on Siobhan that, that was just one of the symptoms that I experienced quite early on and it lasted throughout and even a little bit beyond my two weeks and that was the last symptom to to go but thankfully now I'm, I'm back to normal Brilliant. And can I ask you about the reaction to your piece? Um, we put it together, you took a look at it, we, we, we press send, and uh, then your notifications, I presume, blow up and you've got various requests to, to, to expand on it and talk on it. Um, I think the message that, um, and we did chat about what way we would handle it, the message that you had to deliver was an extremely important one, um, and it's still very relevant right now. Um, but how did you find the reaction to, to you um, talking about this so publicly and I'm sure uh, secondary to that that the messaging contained within the piece is even more relevant uh, at this point in time. Yeah it was very supportive um, my phone did blow up within minutes after the article <laughs> going up and um, just people wishing me well you know asking me if there was anything I could do for them I was getting more goods dropped to the door which I wasn't complaining about um, there was a lot of people got on to me saying they were surprised I could get it, which was, you know, you think yeah, like anyone can get it, but people really thought it was just the elderly, you know, because I got it quite early on. Um, so people thought it was just the elderly or those vulnerable when to hear someone that's young and, and fit enough got it. They, it was kind of a shock to a lot of people. And okay. um, I also had a lot of family in America and England touched base that were quite worried because they have a bit of a different story going on there. 
yeah. um, and it's a bit more of a scary time for them. So they touched base and they were quite scared for me, but I reassured everyone I was fine and, and just the support was great, you know, and I put in time. I had spent hours chatting to people then about it all. So it passed the time as well. But just, just that sense of community and that community spirit. Um, I think as a nation, we've, you know, we're, we're all finding it hard. You particularly haven't, haven't been in isolation for that period of time. Um, but are we seeing, again, some of the best in people and maybe returning to some traditional values, Siobhan, as well? It is. I've probably never been as emotional as I have, you know, over the last few weeks. There's a real sense of, you know, we're in it together and we're all fighting this one battle. And it's lovely. And, um, you know, it's, it's not great that what it has had to happen for this to come about, but there's a real sense of community, you know, there's people doing things for neighbors and elderly family members you know um you'd see a lot of things online of like birthday wishes and people driving by houses to wish yeah kids to birthday. Now, it's just lovely and it does remind you of what's important you know um you're not going out constantly you're spending time with those closest to you and um, you know your family checking in that everyone's well and healthy and and hopefully that will will get through this pretty well in, in a few weeks time some days are, are some days are tougher than others, aren't they? And from a even from a mental viewpoint, and trying to stay positive, Siobhan, and I'm sure you're you've found that as well. Yeah, of course, it's it's definitely harder when we don't have an end date. You yeah. know, if we knew it was just these three weeks, we. It's get the uncertainty. It, it, it really is the uncertainty of it, isn't it, Siobhan? When when is this? You know, I don't think life is ever going to really return to where it was, or not for a long time anyway. But it's just that uncertainty and the wondering and, and then it comes out at, you know, another three weeks and we're into May and people just start to struggle a little bit, I think. Yeah. And, and it's normal and we're allowed to struggle, you know, we're allowed to have our bad days. And um, it's positive that some countries in Europe are starting to lighten restrictions. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, and China obviously as well have done that. So they've, they came out of it first, but they were hit first, obviously. But, um, you know, we're definitely getting, towards the the second half of it if not we're already in it you know so we just have to be positive and we need to listen to those that are giving guidance you know i was watching cnn yesterday um quite late and there was a press conference with trump I saw it. <laughs> and then you go and you watch leo and simon harris and you know um Houlihan and there's no it's black and white like the differences you know there's a there's when the leo and the government and the um medical experts are on you know you really trust them and i do think we're doing so well as a country and um, we're really fighting it as one and we'll reap the benefits of this soon please god you know absolutely we'll finish on a positive siobhan hopes and dreams and aspirations for the future um obviously to get back wearing that sky blue shirt again will be really really nice um what are you looking forward to when we when we reach end game in this I'm looking forward to just seeing you know my family and friends yeah. a lot of them live further than 2k away from me and um, even some of my colleagues because we've gone to we're in teams and we're in shift work I won't see any of them now from I haven't seen them in weeks and I won't see them for several more so just to appreciate people's company I think and um, you know zoom has been great there's been house party apps as well and Facebook chat messengers and everything but it's nothing beats the face-to-face -face contact and that's what I've missed the most you know I have a new nephew he's six weeks old and um, they asked me to be his godmother yesterday by dropping up a cup to the right. door with a picture of us on it because I can't see him or hold him you know and he's getting so big now because he's lo you when you're a baby you grow quite quickly and you lose that kind of baby feel so I want to go see him I have other nieces and nephews that I want to go see so just to get back that social contact again you know face to face and obviously then after that go play football and please god have some games coming up before the year's out you'll enjoy that first little cuddle with him oh i can't wait dreaming yeah. of it already yeah brilliant siobhan it's been great talking to you and look from all of us here we wish you so well um thanks for your honesty and your openness and your agreement in the first place to to, to actually you know to tell your story um i really wanted to follow up with you to see how you're doing it's great to see you doing so well and looking so well and talking so well. So many thanks, Siobhan, and best wishes. No problem, Jackie. Thanks, William, for that. Cheers.